What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode of Hidden Forces is Rudy Havenstein, the owner and operator of a satirical Twitter account that regularly mocks policymakers and politicians for their endless wars, corporate bailouts, and tone-deaf public statements about the economy, American foreign policy, and the state of American democracy. I asked Rudy to come on the podcast because I wanted to understand his perspective on what he feels has gone wrong in America and what it would take for voters like him to feel that the country is moving in the right direction. This conversation is meant to be accessible to anyone, irrespective of your beliefs, preconceptions, or pre-existing knowledge about the subjects that we explore in today's episode. One of the biggest challenges we face today is that people aren't listening to one another or trying to understand each other's perspectives. I devote the first hour of today's conversation to understanding Rudy's perspective, how he grew up, his experience of America as a young man growing up in the 1960s and 70s, how the country has changed in the intervening decades, and what his central grievances are against the ruling class and the government in Washington. In the second hour, Rudy and I discuss how those of us who care about the future of American and Western democracy can engage constructively in solutions that move our country forward. What is the story that we need to tell ourselves about who we are and what we're capable of that will help bring this country together during what I believe is one of the most precarious times in our country's history. You can access that part of the conversation on our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe, where you can also join in on the conversation by becoming a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners. And with that, please enjoy this thoughtful and wide-ranging conversation with my guest, Rudy Havenstein. Rudy Havenstein, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Nice to be here. So for people that don't know you, Rudy, some of those people, there's a subset of listeners who don't know you and who know who Rudolf Havenstein is, and that's going to be a little confusing. So Rudy Havenstein is your online alias. Right. Tell me why your online alias is named after a famous central banker who oversaw the hyperinflation in Germany in the 1920s. Because starting in the 90s, I would do email to like just friends about what was going on, things that interest me, kind of like my Substack now of just rant, eclectic stuff that interested me in the markets. And a lot of them liked it. And it was small. It was like a couple hundred people, maybe by the time I was stopped doing that. And um, things I take for granted about, you know, the Fed or about things that go on in the, in the markets and stuff that other people, including very, you know, educated, smart people, completely unaware of. And so uh, since the last 20 years or so, I've been able to spend full-time trading and stuff. I I have the time to like, you know, research stuff and look into stuff. And so I was, my, it was just basically like to, so I could, you know, raise awareness, you know, and, and some people want that and some people don't, you know, and then, so I don't know exactly what triggered it in April, 2013, but I'd never been on, on Twitter as doing anything other than reading the news, maybe I'd, I'd be on it. But I started the account because I thought, well, you know what? I don't know what triggered it, but maybe it was something relation, inflation related or something. I, you know, every day for the last 10 years until 2021 or something, every day on CNBC and in the FT and in the Wall Street Journal, someone would say, there's no inflation. And I'd be like, you got to be kidding me. What are you talking about? And so I think I probably decided to start tweeting, you know, my thoughts, kind of like putting my emails into like tweets, which is a perfect format for me. And I was always interested in that period around World War One and the and the hyperinflation afterwards. And I didn't know who to be. I didn't really want to be myself because you know there's a lot of nuts out there. But um, I uh, figured, hey, this is a you know I was familiar with Rudolf Havenstein, and and I thought I think for most people you know inflation is awful, and I think hyperinflation is the worst possible outcome for any country, a currency collapse. I mean, look what's going on in Venezuela or something, or look what happened in Weimar, Germany. I think it directly led to the uh, rise of Hitler. His push was in 
1923, we failed, but that was at the height, uh, the absolute peak of inflation in Germany. So, and Germany was a major country, right? So I know they had other issues. I'm not comparing America to, to Germany. I'm not saying that hyperinflation is imminent in the United States. I'm not like one of those. I said that years ago. I'm not, I'm just saying you got to be careful. You got to be careful anybody that starts monetizing their debt, which I think we've started doing. So when you started the account, so again, for people that don't follow you on Twitter, you have an account with a little over 100,000 followers. Yeah. And it's a satirical account. And as you said, it started as an account focused on in inflation or the larger, I would say probably the the larger issue stemming from the 2008 financial crisis. But oh, yeah. it's since evolved to be a commentary account about all sorts of government corruption or malfeasance, et cetera. Right. You and I have exchanged messages going back to, I guess, 2017 is when you first messaged me on Twitter. This is something that I just found out literally a few minutes ago because you told me. <laughs> but we've we've exchanged messages and all sorts of stuff. And the, the reason that I wanted to have you on was because I feel like you represent a particular viewpoint that's pretty prevalent, not just online, but also offline. And you and I, I think, share many of the same grievances around the 2008 financial crisis, around the 2003 war in Iraq. And what I've been trying to do on the show is to not just highlight those, but to try and find constructive ways forward. And I feel like a lot of times where you and I maybe disagree is the extent to which I emphasize one, the extent to which you emphasize the other. And you're not unique in that. I I often find myself in that situation with listeners. If you would have to describe your central grievance or central grievances against the government, against the ruling class, or or the things that are at issue for you in terms of where we are in America today, your concerns. What's the story you would tell? What is that you feel that has happened to our country that upsets you so much and that animates the satire of your account? Well, I always, I, I've had the same pinned tweet for years. Unfortunately, one day I deleted it. I don't know why. I was trying to delete probably some bot tweet and I deleted my pin tweet. So I got, but I have an archive. So I basically just put it back up as my pin tweet. It's the same tweet. I did it years before whatever the date is on that now. And it covered, I said, I have two main issues. I said, it's the war, the, the military industrial corporatist complex that Eisenhower warned us about in 61. Everyone should read Eisenhower's farewell address. It's a brilliant speech. And clearly, you know, my entire life we've been at war. You know, haven't declared any wars anymore. We don't do that. So that's a big deal to me. I think that's when a were huge you born? Problem. I was born nineteen. Well, right before Kennedy, so in the sixty-three. Yeah. So Vietnam was going on, and as a, I, I was young, but I was aware. You know, I'd come home from school and put on Gilligan's Island, and my dad, who was a teacher, would come home at you know four o'clock or something, and. And turn the always turn to the news, and there's only three channels back then, only one TV, you know. So I'd be sitting there. I was always reading, and I was always I was older than my age, you know. And I and I, I was very interested because my dad was very uh, interested in politics. So I was watching, you know, Cronkite and Rather and the body bags and all that as a very young child, and I soaked it in. And the other the other thing that's on my pen tweet is the what I call the banksters or the kleptocracy. Which you know we just saw just so naked and and blatant in two thousand eight and nine, and then well, I think we saw it again in March twenty twenty. I mean, I tweeted at the time in March twenty twenty. I I tweeted the sound you hear right now is the Gini ratio spiking, and I think that you know there's very few of my tweets over the years that I regret. You know, some of them in my early years I was kind of like trying to find my voice. You know, so there's some of them are just stupid. You know, but that one I think resonates because I was like, hey, you know all the governmental you know, bailouts and programs and money and cash that made these guys, the villains of 2008, even richer than they were. Multiply that by a thousand, I said this time in 2020. And oh, by the way, here's two grand or here's your $600 or something. In other words, they, they, yeah, here's your, you know, here's a dollar for you and here's, you know, a hundred billion for Larry Fink or something. So yeah, that's it. The kleptocrats and the warmongers. And, you know, I tell people sometimes, you know, I used to be uh, a real like, you know, in my younger years before I grew up, a Cold War hawk. You know, I mean, I grew up when we were doing duck and cover drills under deaths. You expect a nuclear war at any time. So when you say you were, when you say you were a Cold War hawk, what does that mean? And up until when were you that? 
I was, in other words, like, uh, yeah, we should, oh, okay, they're, uh, I, I was very anti-Soviet, very anti-communist. I still am. Pro-Vietnam War? Even you were, though you were a kid? Well, you my dad a was, and I'm, you know, I'm a little kid. I probably thought, yeah, we got to stop these commies. Yeah. I mean, and then in the first Gulf War, which most people have forgotten in the 90s, I read a book called Deterring Democracy by Noam Chomsky. Now, I basically grew up as a very conservative guy, and Chomsky is not a conservative guy. So he, in uh, Deterring Democracy, I remember reading that because I always tried to read stuff that wasn't conservative. I tried to read all, view, all views. And he makes the point. I had always wondered, hey, why is why is Castro bad, but Batista is good? Or why is Samosa good and, and uh, Sandinistas are bad? I mean, they both like, you know, we're killing people. Why is the Shah good? And, and you know, the, the mullahs are bad. I mean, I think the mullahs are bad, but the Shah was pretty bad too. And, by, and we installed him. And I never, I was like, oh, why is that, you know? And it doesn't matter if you're killed by a communist or by a, a Nazi or something, does it? I mean, you're both you're dead either way. And Chomsky explains that, look, is the country friendly to U.S. business interests? If so, then they're a friend. And if not, they're an enemy and they're, they're Hitler. You know, I mean, people were calling Saddam Hitler, uh, but he was our ally until he wasn't, you know. So I, I think Chomsky in that book really explained that it, it wasn't about freedom and democracy and human rights and elections and all that. It was about, because we support a lot of bad, we still do, you know. It's about, you know, America at power. And I can understand that. I mean, you do it, you do, you're a lot more focused, it seems, on, on foreign policy than I am. But because I see the problems at home here that I think we need to be dealing with. But yeah, so over the years, I guess I got more anti-war and I definitely, and I'm not a pacifist, but definitely the Iraq war was insane. I mean, it's like invading attacking Tibet after Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, in my mind, or some country worse than Tibet. But you know what I mean? It's like it made no sense, especially since, you know, 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi. And there's plenty of evidence that the Saudi royal family was, at least some of them were aware, if not actively supporting it. I mean, I, I, I you know, but there's another, you know, conspiracy theory, right? Well, but, I don't um, know if you ever heard my episode with Senator Bob Kerry, who was one I of did. the- I did. I did. Well, there you go. He was one of the 10, 9, 11 members of the 9-11 Commission, and uh, he made the claim on my show that it was a conspiracy that went all the way up to the highest levels of the Saudi royal family. I agree. I think the evidence is, would show, well, certainly we, we're never going to see all the evidence. What is the myth of America that you grew up with, that you feel you were disabused of at some point in your life? Well, it wasn't a myth. I mean, my dad was a teacher, and he bought a house in like, Early 60s. No, but I mean, when you read Noam Chomsky's which book? Because Jom's written, he's like 5,000 uh, books. Deterring Democracy. Okay, deterring, so when you read yeah. Deterring Democracy, yeah, there were certain views of America that all of a sudden were assaulted by reading that book for you. And so what I'm asking is, what is the myth of what America was, why we did things, our purpose in the world? What was the story that you told yourself that you believed in? Before you began to become disabused of that beginning, it sounds like around the time of the Gulf War. Right. Well, that's what I was trying to say when I said that it wasn't about democracy. And I, I had believed that, I had thought that, you know, we're the good guys and they're the bad guys and we care. We want to help the people of whatever country we were invading. And I didn't really think about it too much. I just thought, oh, yeah, we're the, we're the good guys. We care about, you know, and that was disabused. Once I start thinking about it, I go, oh, now it all makes sense. Why do we like a Batista and not Castro? Well, you know, a huge reason is Batista kicked out all the, you know, the gangsters and the U.S. businesses and nationalized things. And Samosa was great, you know, for us. And uh, the Sandinistas weren't. And and I, this isn't in any support of Castro or the Sandinistas. I'm just saying, you know, let's not say we're going to invade this country because we want to, you know, freedom is on the march, George Bush used to say, as if we're bringing freedom to, uh, you know, Iraq. So you believed in the messianic mission of America. You believed in American beneficence and altruism as the core driving logic of American foreign policy. I didn't think we were as cynical as I later believe we are. And yeah, so that was kind of you know, that was what, 30 years ago or something, I started really thinking about it. Because I, like I said, I grew up very conservative and anti-communist. And, uh, but when I started thinking about it, things made sense, you know. Yeah. So, and here I am today, but I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not, I mean, we haven't declared war since 1941, right? 
but we've been in a ton of wars and we have a ton of troops in, I don't know, well over a hundred countries. So I'm not a pacifist. Is there an existential threat to the United States from a country? You know, I've tweeted seven or eight years ago, hey, if Syria is an existential threat to Americans, you know, well, let's go to Congress and have them debate it and then have them pass a war resolution and have the president sign it and let's raise taxes and let's go fight it, not jerk around for 20 years and really fight it to win and then get out, you know, but we never do that anymore. And you could replace Syria with Iran or with, uh, you know, I, people have been wanting to go to war for, with Iran ever since 1980. And I can't tell you how many articles, I think I tweeted something on it one time about how many articles over the years about, you know, Iran is, you know, two weeks away from a nuclear weapon. I mean, you literally can find articles from like 30 years ago about that. And maybe they are. Is your view that the United States should only fight wars that are existential? Or is your problem that we haven't declared wars where we have used military force? Well, okay. Existential would mean like we're, we're, we think this country is imminently, or they already have attacked us, you know, with, with bad weapons. You could argue, you know, uh, I'm not arguing this, but you could say that Iran is a, let's say grave threat, you know, rather than existential. Iran is a grave threat to the United States because if they get nukes and they, you, you, they've said they're going to, you know, they want to blow Israel off the map. And of course, Israel has nukes. Yeah, I guess, okay, that's a grave issue. And some could, and let, so let's debate that in Congress and let's pass, let's follow the Constitution. And actually, if it's that much, declare war, president can declare war, sign it. And so you have the, the, you have the Constitution. That's the thing. I don't think we follow the Constitution much anymore. It's been totally trashed by the war on drugs and, the, and then the war on terror and then the war on COVID. And so what, let's do that. Let's follow the Constitution. If something is serious enough that 18 year old American kids should die, then let's have Congress vote on it. And you know what? Let's not put it on the credit card and have the Fed monetize bonds. Let's let's raise taxes to pay for it. How many wars would we have gone in in the last 40 years or 50 years or 70, you know, whatever it is, if we had to raise taxes to pay for it? Or you send bill, you send uh, who get who benefits most from Pax America? I mean, from, uh, you know, the American empire, people like Bill Gates or Ray Dalio or Larry Fink, send them a bill and say, hey, we calculated that your your contribution to this uh, war effort is going to be $10 billion. Let's see how many wars we go to then. I mean, that's one way to look at it. Were you against the first Gulf War? At the time, were you against it? At the time? No, no. So, since, you know, since, knowing what you know now, would you have been against it? I think- they let. They knew he was. They, they, the impression I get is they kind of said they didn't care if he went into Kuwait, and then suddenly they cared. Well, that's the the claim that that you're making is that the comments made by the U.S. ambassador to Iraq, if we're talking about the same thing, that she made comments in a meeting that she had with Saddam Hussein a week before his invasion of Kuwait, that left him with the impression that the U.S. would take sides in Iraq's border dispute with Kuwait, and that this was somehow intended as a green light for an Iraqi invasion. I think this is one of those never explain with malice what can be explained by stupidity situations. I think it's much easier to make that argument in retrospect after the US was able to get UN and congressional joint resolutions to force Iraq out of Kuwait by sending hundreds of thousands of troops into harm's way in America's first major war since Vietnam. So in other words, I don't I don't think that George Bush or Jim Baker actually wanted Saddam to invade Kuwait. Yeah. You know, we funded them in their war against Iran for years in the 80s. And I, I always laughed because I think, I mean, I don't, it's not funny, but they always would say he used gas against his own people. Well, I think, and you know, people can correct me if I'm wrong. I think he used gas against his own people when we were, when we were supporting him against Iran and I, against the Shiites down in the South or whatever. And, I, and I, to be honest, we probably gave him the gas. I think he got most of those from the French, actually. Okay. But the point is, no. I mean, I wasn't like really upset about you know, going after Saddam. He's a bad guy. There's a lot of bad guys in the world. Many of them are our allies. Do you think now that the, the United States should not have, with UN authorization, mounted a force of whatever it was. I think at the time it was 700,000 troops or yeah, more. Yeah, Coalition of the Willing. Yeah. Co no, no. The Coalition of the Willing was in 2003 when, oh, that was when, the other when George War. W. Yeah. Bush did not get UN authorization, but George H.W. Bush got UN authization. He sought it and got it, and he invaded in a multinational I force. I remember. 
I remember. So, but, so what I, today, knowing what you know now, would you be have been against that decision? Well, why not send the Saudi 18-year-olds to go fight that battle? Or the Kuwaitis. What I remember is the Kuwaitis were like in Vegas, you know, partying, you know, while Americans were over there, you know? That ticks me off. Did, would, I, uh, would I oppose it now? I don't know. We have oil interests there that we have to worry about. I could see they could say this is a grave threat to the United States. Saddam was setting oil fields on fire. It's a threat not just to, it was, you know, that was a major threat. I'm not going to uh, die on the hill of, of arguing against the first Gulf War. Well, the reason I bring it up, though, too, well, there are a lot of reasons that I probably bring it up, but the one that comes to mind, the reason that I brought it up, a conscious reason, is because 1991 was a really pivotal moment in the transition from one modality of thinking about America's role in the world, which was mm -hmm. to hold the Soviet threat at bay, mm -hmm. to a new version, which was this unipolar moment of leading the world into a new century. And exactly what that would look like and what threats really justified the defense budget and America's continued military presence around the world was never really clear, in my view. I mean, it ultimately became about this desire to create a new world order that would be led by the United States, acting through the United Nations, where we would be spreading capitalism and democracy all over the world, and everyone would just live in harmony. So when Saddam invaded Kuwait, he was challenging this new order which was expected to, among other things, enforce the territorial sovereignty of smaller nation states, many of which would incidentally become especially vulnerable in the aftermath of the collapse of the USSR. So here's my question to kind of bring it to a focal point. If we're now thinking about where we are today in this 30-year transition, is your view that the US foreign policy establishment in its attempt to find a new rationale for the persistence of the national security state is manufacturing threats where they don't exist and that the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party are just the latest examples of this. That in other words, this time is no different than 2003 and just the latest attempt by the military industrial complex to hijack American foreign policy. Well, I do think that there's an actual threat from China, not so much a military threat, I think. But, you know, back in the 60s, they would say about the they would say about the Chinese communists back then, we'll sell them the rope to hang us with. And I remember that phrase from back then. And, and I think that's what we, it, it would be nice if people had said something for the last 20 years when we basically exported in the labor arbitrage, everything, all our labor, to, a lot of it to China. And uh, guys like Schwartzman are over there standing next to Mao Zedong posters, you know, talking about you know, he's going to make a boatload of money there. And Ray Dalio, who I think is basically works, and, and Hank Paulson works for President Z. I mean, so they, you got all these billionaires. They don't care about America. They love to have, they love to have a Chinese type system here, I think. I think they like that. They'd love to have a social credit system. And I mean, look at Larry Fink until recently, his, his ESG pronouncements for everything. So China is a real threat, but I don't, they're not going to invade us. But why is 95% of our antibiotics made in China? I mean, that's just insane to me. It would have been nice if people had cared about that the last 20 years. So I just want to throw a parallel out, which was the Gilded Age and the baronial era, the period of rapid accumulation of wealth and the creation of industrial magnates in the early 20th century. Many of those people supported fascism in Europe. They supported Mussolini. They supported Hitler. Yep. And yet somehow we managed to find a sense of what was the public interest to overcome that and to create a new regulatory state, a welfare system in the United States, and fight World War II and create a new order. And that led to the blossoming middle class of which you were a part. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I, I say that. Why do I say that? I just say it to say that these things can be true and we can also find ways to come together as a citizenry and to build something better, which I think you'd agree. So oh, if Rudy yeah. Havenstein was president of the United States, and by the way, this is a really difficult question to ask. Like, I don't think that like you should necessarily have this answer, but it's I think it's a useful thought experiment. What are the things that you would like to see happen? What are the top priorities that you would like to see happen? And try as you can to be also as realistic as possible in terms of the fact that like there are political forces in the country. I'm not saying dictator Rudy, I'm saying president yeah. Havenstein. 
Yeah, I've all, I, I've joked before that I'd be a terrible president, but I think I'd be a pretty good dictator. So we'll see about that. I would come out on day one and I would say, have a speech and I would talk to Americans and look them in the eye and say, you know what? I want you to know, as president, I care more about American citizens than I do non-American citizens. I think right off the bat, you'd hear a couple hundred million people high-fiving each other. Okay, so America first, fine. But lots of other little Rudy Hyvensies might say, well, that's bullshit. He is just pandering to the crowd. So what would you do to really show people that Americans come first? People want to feel safe, okay? So uh, this week I saw a video of a woman with luggage in Chicago getting robbed at gunpoint by a half dozen people that jump out of a car. You've got people in Arizona and, and Texas that are dealing with uncontrolled, unchecked mass immigration. We don't know who these people are. And I'm not anti-immigrant. I think immigration is one of the big positives for the United States. And thank God we're next to Mexico. But those people are overwhelmed, okay? And now they're overwhelmed in other cities where these people go. And someone said that the problems like in, in Europe are going to be coming here. So I don't want that because I care more about American citizens than non-American citizens. I'm sorry. That's, that's just, I'm president of the United States. And Americans need to feel safe. Right now, you see videos every day of ma mass robbery, mass burglaries and robberies in um, stores all across California. Um, people are like, I don't, they don't feel safe. And, you know, there's basic functions that government should provide. Like your downtown should not look like a zombie video game. Okay. And then to add insult to injury, this crap in San Francisco, for example, has been going on forever with London Breed and with Gavin Newsom. They don't care. They didn't care at all until President Xi of China visited. And Newsom even admitted it. Hey, you know, we have the we have our special friends over for dinner. And Americans see that <laughs> and they go, they see that and they go, I mean, it ticks them off, let me tell you. And it ticks off people from wealthy small business owners to everybody, almost everybody, except the people who vote for, you know, hang around with Gavin Newsom and somehow he keeps getting elected. I think Americans need to feel like we're in the same boat that, you know, yeah, you got Larry Fink and you got the poor kid here, but, you know, there's a justice system and it's, you know, it's not perfect. And we try, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that ever really existed, but there's always been two rules, one for the people above us, you know, the, the special people, and then one for everyone else. And we saw that in spades in 2008, 2009. I think we saw it again in 2020. And so that ticks people off. And I would try and stop that. I put some, you know, I'd say to the DOJ, no, 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 no. we're not going to find JP Morgan for their sixth felony count. The brick and mortar of JP Morgan did not commit this crime. The shareholders did not commit this crime. Who committed it? Let's go. And by the way, let's, let's subpoena power. Let's get Jamie Dimon and all these other guys, all the executives. And let's, if we find the evidence, I don't think they really try to find the evidence. Just say, okay, we're going to hit you with a $5 billion fine. And JP Morgan goes, okay, cost of doing business. You start putting some people in jail. If, as I've said before, if we would have put the DOJ, you know, we had th like three thousand criminal referrals of the SNL crisis in like '89. You know, William Black. I'm always quoting him. I had him on Capital Account a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, we had what one or two guys went to, you know, nothing, nothing. And if we would have treated the uh, 2008 and nine like the uh, SNL crisis, because like three thousand criminal referrals or something, people went to jail. Powerful people. We would not have Trump today. You know, we could talk about that, you know, and people need to feel accountability. There's no accountability. Who was held accountable for Afghanistan? Great piece in the Washington Post that talks about 20 years, the American people were constantly lied to. And we were lied to in Vietnam and we were lied to in Afghanistan. And when the Ukraine thing started, you know, truth is the first casualty of war. And people ask me, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? I go, I don't know what to believe because I've been lied to my entire life. I was lied to about Vietnam or my, my dad was. I was lied to about Libya. I was lied to about Iraq. And so why wouldn't I think they're lying now? And then I just think Americans need to feel like they care. There's an article I sent you today that was from March 2022. And it says, you know, the headline is Biden says the union is strong. And then back home in Scranton, the mood is dour. And the opening sentence, which I tweeted, was Ukraine is a mild concern in Scranton. Locals say something about the nation doesn't work anymore. Inflation is soaring. Wages aren't keeping up. Labor shortages appear. Government is dysfunctional. And the American dream seems out of reach. That right there is what I care about. Yeah. Let's fix America before we go and fix Israel and Ukraine and all the other little 
Nigeria and all the little countries in the world that we have troops in. Let's do that. Or at least put more emphasis on the people who are the citizens here who should be proud of this country. Now they feel like it's a dysfunctional, you know, dystopia. You know, go to any major downtown and you're like, what the hell happened to America? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I very much agree with the sentiment. Actually, it reminds me of a conversation I had with Ian Bremmer. And I was trying to make a similar point, albeit in a more maybe subtle way. And his response was, he seemed to almost become a little indignant about it and say to me, if you don't care about climate change, because I wasn't saying I didn't care about climate change, but I think I was making a point about like, how exactly are we calculating these trade-offs that we're making here? And you know who's bearing the cost domestically for this? And uh, his response was, if you don't care about climate change, it means you don't care about people in Sri Lanka. And if you don't care about people in Sri Lanka, and then he made a point, he goes, I'm not, I forget exactly what the word he used, but his point was to say that he's more of an, again, he didn't necessarily use this language, but he basically said essentially like, I'm more of a citizen of the world. He didn't say it like that. And I don't want to put words in Ian's mouth because I don't have the transcript in front of me, but it was something along those lines and somehow suggesting that what I was saying was more sort of like America first kind of thing. And I think what, what I think what guys like Ian, in my view, and it's not just Ian, like this is something that I've observed for a long time, is that what they don't seem to maybe recognize is that these Republican forms of government, these national democracies, don't work if the people who are the voting citizenry don't feel like the government is adequately representing their needs. And mm -hmm. it's easy for them to be concerned about the broader international community because they're not constrained. They don't need the national government to work in the same way that most people do. And I feel like what's happened in America is that, you know, to quote like Pat Buchanan, who used to say, you know, a republic, not an empire. The thing is, America is an empire. And I think it's just gotten to a place where the many of the politicians have lost sight of their responsibility to the people of the republic. And that's where we're kind of at today. So that the real issue in my mind isn't that my view, we could talk about Ukraine. I support Ukraine and we could talk about why, but I think the support of Ukraine cannot come at the expense of doing what matters for the people of the United States. You can't put Ukrainians or Israelis ahead of the American people. Those things need to be addressed first. And I yeah. think that's where I would come down on that issue. Well, first of all, Ian Bremer is a Davos regular all-star. I mean, he's just one of many. I made fun of him 10 years ago on here because he, you know, Davos I've been picking on forever because that is emblematic of everything that, that Americans hate. I think these elites, you know, they had a panel in Davos years ago on, you know, Larry Summers and Ray Dalio talking about the middle class. And I was just, and Lagarde was there too. You just can't get any more absurd than that. Yeah. I told you the other day, I, you know, Americans need to feel like they're more important than anybody in Israel or Ukraine. And I care more about some poor black kid I've never met in Ohio than I do about somebody that looks like me in Turkmenistan. You know, I just don't, you know, we have first things first. Now, if our country is perfect and we don't have these random street robberies and we have sane immigration policies and we, you know, everybody's doing pretty good, we have a good safety net and most people are happy, I mean, then fine, let's go fix the world. But we got a lot in America to fix. We have what? How many? 75,000 or something died of, died of fentanyl? You know, we had a record suicides, I think, in the past year. I saw the headline. The monetary policy the last 20 years is all about the stock market. You know, so now you've got the top 1% on like 53.8% of equities. I mean, it's, I don't know, man. It's just like, Brammer is just like all of them. He doesn't care about the guy in the street in the United States. And I'm saying we should. You know what was big for me besides the Iraq war was Hurricane Katrina, where I'm mm. watching, I was home and I'm watching on the TV very closely. I was watching every day and I'm like, man, because I'm not in Louisiana. And I saw days are going by and and I had, a, I had a fireman buddy who went there the next day and was, you know, ended up scooping bodies and marking X's on the houses and stuff. But there's people, there's like 80 year old people on the roof three days later or something, waving to the helicopters. And then you see Chertoff on TV 
going, oh, no, there's no water shortage. Everything's fine. You know, you've got George Bush saying, heck of a job, Brownie. Yeah. And I'm watching, and these are mostly elderly, poor black people on roofs. And I'm like, this is America. And at the time I said, you know, I live in California. We have earthquakes. I hope that if there's an 8.0 earthquake and I'm laying under a beam, I like to think that I'm going to have within maybe a day, I got to stick it out until the crane comes to pull it off me. But I'm watching these people and it went by for days and days. And then I think the Coast Guard guys finally came in and straightened everything out. But that was really, I was like, this is America. We should care about these people. They're not like me at all, but I should, I care about them. I remember that and I had the same... I mean, I had the response of also being like kind of flabbergasted because the Bush administration had paid so much lip service to the human rights of the people in Afghanistan oh, yeah. and Iraq. But that kind of humanitarian concern and that compassionate conservatism that Bush ran on in 2000 was nowhere to be found in 2005 in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. By the way, it also... It was not just Bush. We didn't see it with the with the 9-11 first responders who needed a stand-up comedian to represent them in the halls yeah. of Congress to try and get them the care they needed for, for selflessly putting themselves in harm's way to help this country begin to rebuild from the moment of the terrorist attacks onward. So the question is for you, Rudy, in a very simple way, what do you think accounts for that disconnect between the way that the Bush administration or other administrations have dealt with foreign policy concerns, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Israel, whether it's Afghanistan, and the lackadaisical response that we've seen in domestic crises, whether it was Katrina, whether it was the 9-11 first responders, whether it's the fentanyl crisis or some other domestic issue. What do you think explains that? I think it's because we have the same goofballs who got us in all these issues over the last 20, 30 years still around. There's no accountability. But is that really it though? But do you really think that the issue is simply that the people in office today are the problem? If we just replace those people, that this problem will not persist? They all go to the same colleges. They all, you know, the media, all they care about is impressing other people in the media. They're totally disconnected and it's been going on forever. I mean, think about Yellen's only regret leaving the Fed was low inflation. I mean, how more out of touch can you get? Powell said he wanted inflation to run above 2%. It's like a higher cost of living is something Americans are excited about. So let me put this forward. And this is not, I don't know if this is the right analogy, Yeah. but let's take like American matrimonial relationships in the 1950s. Okay. And then let's take like, you know, male female relations in the 1970s or in the 1990s or something. Mm -hmm. where the power dynamics had changed somewhat, right? Well, they've tried to destroy the nuclear family. Well, 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 but before I'm saying that, no, no, but I'm I'm talking about the positive facts, which is that women in the relationship the 1950s had less power in the relationship. Again, I don't know if this is the right example, but it was the first one that came to mind. Many women would have been dissatisfied in those relationships, irrespective of who they were married to, because the prevailing uh, systems were such that one party in the relationship had much more power than the other. The parallel, as sloppily as I'm trying to draw it, is that I don't think the issue, Rudy, is the sort of discrete particular of the leaders that exist today, but rather what are the systemic issues that are creating the, the outcomes of where the president cares more about what's the people in Afghanistan that are wearing headscarves versus yeah. the people who are on the roofs in in with uh, in Louisiana, and I would say that this brings us to a central issue, which is not discussed in America, in my view, at least not sufficiently, which is power. Who has power in America? Where does power reside, and how important is that for determining what the outcomes of our democratic politics are? Those people down in Louisiana didn't have a lot of power, and what we've seen over the decades in America is the concentration of power, of private power which gets channeled through public mechanisms, through the government, for private ends. That is the issue in my view, and those people are the ones driving what the candidates are that have become elected to high office, not the sort of one-off elections that happen and simply if we just have more elections, we're going to get the same result if we don't shift the power dynamic. Well, I mean, my approach has been to try and point out this to the people. I mean- But do you agree with that though, that premise that 
that the real issue underlying this is that the distribution of power in the country at the civic level, at the level of citizenry. And we could talk about how that power manifests, whether we're talking about wealth, whether we're talking about income or some other vector of power, but it's really about the power of each individual in society and not just the random assortment of leaders at the top of the hierarchy? Well, most people have absolutely no power. I mean, people are talking about Hillary Clinton possibly running in the next election. I mean, under some scenario. What? I mean, we have the same people. You know, as I, I wrote 2017, I said, is it so shocking, or 2016, is it so shocking that people wanted a president that wasn't named Clinton or Bush? I mean, Larry Summers is still around. He's been around since the 90s or, or the 80s, probably. I mean, Yellen's been at the Fed since 77, off and on. It's the same villains or the same type of villain. Uh, the article I tweeted the other day about Obama, you know, is a hollow man. He just, it's a great piece from Tablet Magazine. And it talks about how he just, I'll retweet it, but they just get lost in their own little world of, of these elite groups. But Joe Biden spent Thanksgiving with David Rubenstein, the head of the Carlyle Group, which is where Powell came from too. Back, I was hearing a guy tell an anecdote about how his dad was just a laborer the other day. It, was, it must've been some podcast or something. And his dad uh, was in the Navy and was friends with another guy in the Navy who ended up being like one of the richest guys in America. I forget the name, but, and he said, you know, years later, his dad, when uh, he visited back where he grew up, the guy was still there, you know, still super wealthy. They'd go have dinner together or hang out. And he said it wasn't, there was no, they were the same. They were the same. And so um, to see Joe Biden spending Thanksgiving with David Rubenstein, and Republicans do it too. I'm very bipartisan. I hate both parties. It's just bad optics. There's a pick from um, a couple years ago, probably some G20 meeting or something, where you've got all the leaders of the world. I mean, there's a bunch of them standing on a stage, standing next to first responders. And none of the leaders are masked, including Joe Biden, who, you know, was you know, at his age, uh, I think he's a risk for COVID, right? And then every first responder standing right next to them is masked. And I, I what well, the, the optics, they don't get it. They are completely clueless. And so out of I touch. hear, I do hear that. But so, like, I want to bring us back. But before As for I power, do that, we got to vote them out. I also want to say that yeah. the press, for example, in the 1960s was complicit in hiding the extent of Kennedy's affairs. Yeah. I think it's important to maybe recognize also that. We know much more today than we used to know because media is so pervasive and everyone's got a camera. We know because we're depending on people who aren't in the official media. Right. So I, That's so, how we know more. Well, so I do think that people today are more out of touch, but I also think the other thing is also true that we know much more today than we used to. You know, We didn't have Alex Jones running through Bohemian Grove in 1960. Yeah, but he got banned from everything, didn't he? Well, he also did a lot of really disgusting stuff. Like create complete bullshit stories about people's kids not even existing and crisis actors up in the school shooting that was really devastating yeah, for those parents. Yeah, and, he never, and he I'm never took responsibility for that. No, no, I I'm just want to say it's a great, it's an important thing to point out, which is yes, Alex Jones is scapegoated, right? Like a lot of people become convenient scapegoats, just like Donald Trump. He was a convenient scapegoat of the American left which droned on about Russia, 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 which as you know, if you listen to my podcast from the very beginning was something I took issue with. And yet yep. he himself is a really, what's the charitable way were to describe it? He's, I called him he's a even, pig. He's even less, yeah, his ethics are even worse than the but people in But Trump power. didn't fall from the sky. Trump was the culmination of years of terrible policy. And there's been no introspection So let's bring us None. back to that. So let, I just want to, my goal is not to interject, but I want to try and keep us on a on a steady path towards ultimately where I want to go, which is I want to understand what your view is in terms of what the best way forward is for this country. Because ultimately, that's where I've really been focusing, as you know, on this show, um, talking about what are the constructive way, ways forward? What can we do? So power is one of those things, which is why we got Donald Trump, right? There's a disempowerment of masses. People feel less and less represented. They have less and less of a seat at the table in the complex wrangling of interest group politics, which is why you get populism, which is people going to the ballot box and voting in a populist candidate, which is why we got Trump. So the power is part of it. How much of it do you think is ethics? In other words, that American society has become in general more corrupted, more corruptible, and the people's ethical notion of what's right and what's wrong has really deteriorated over the years. I think most people are good people. But I think when they're, if you look at the videos of these 
groups of thieves in the stores, the security guard standing there twiddling his thumbs. And a lot of times it's other shoppers that are trying to stop it because they're outraged by it. It's like, I live by the rules. I don't steal. What's this guy doing? So I don't think we've reached a point where where everyone is, has their hand out for a corrupt bribe. But certainly at the top, you know, we have people who've been in the Congress for 40 years and they leave with $100 million or $200 million. How does that happen? There's no investigation because then we'd find the culprits. So it's completely disconnected. You're asking for solutions. I'm saying we got to get rid of- Well, before we, we get- we, Right. No, no, yeah. I hear that. But before right. we get even to that, so is it just these elites that are corrupt? Or is it the massive society that's become increasingly corrupt? You know, if everyone's to blame, then no one's to blame. I mean, I don't buy that. No, that every all Americans not are all, but are that more, many more people have become corrupt. Otherwise, why would people like? I think many more politicians have become corrupt now because the money is so huge, and you have these lifers that are there forty years. I think Dick Durbin. I saw the other day McConnell, Pelosi. Yeah, I do not think that the average American has become more corrupt. I absolutely think that the people in power are more corrupt. I think the money has a lot to do with it. You know, how much is Biden going to be worth? You know, how much is, you know, Trump was already worth something. But that's my answer to your question. Well, why has America, so what about the fact that America has become such a more litigious society over the decades? This isn't something that's, you know, recent. We've become more and more litigious as a society. People's words matter less and less. What's on paper, what's in an email is what's matter having a paper trail. Or maybe lawyers found out they could start getting these massive judgments. I mean, I don't know. You know, like I said something the other day, like a jury, a lot of people who can't even come up with $400, they don't know the difference between a million dollars and a billion dollars. You know, see, that's how you get some of these juries in certain counties and certain states that, and they lawyers are, they were ambulance chasers 50 years ago. So they go after the money. There's so many people who put money first. And I honestly did not put money first. I could be much richer right now and I'm not because I had enough and I wanted to take care of the kids and grandkids. By take care, I mean like being around them. And I, I think that's what most people are doing. That's why I started trying to educate people is because they're too busy living their lives and trying to survive with two jobs or something to know about how they're getting screwed. And they're getting screwed more and more. And it, it bugs me. It, it bugs me. You know, I, I, I say I just want to bash the Fed and tweet funny videos, but all this other corruption just really bugs me. So I never wanted to be political at all because there's so many people that do that badly. But anyway, I know where you're asking. I don't know what you're asking me. Like, uh, you know, is America? I mean, I don't know. I do not think. Well, your look, for example, you is the problem. You and I are the same way in the sense that, like, I mean, I can relate to the statement that, like, money is not my driving force. But for more people today, it is than it used to be. I don't know. Well, I mean, they have to, to survive. I don't know. Inflation. I wouldn't go there. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. I would disagree with that. I would say that culturally, millennials, and I can't speak for Generation Z, but I can tell you that for my demographic especially the younger millennials, really, money is much more important than it was for us, for me, when we were growing up. What they think they need to have at their age, inflation adjusted, is much higher than it was for us. During COVID, you know, we had the whole YOLO culture come out. And, you know, me being what I focus on, was, I mean, you got Neil Kashkari on 60 Minutes saying, there's no limit to our ability to create money. And, you know, yeah. Pelly goes, are you, are you saying there's no limit? And Kashkari, there is no limit. And I love to I love to get these little clips, which really encapsulate the problem. So I could see some kid, you know, at the GameStop thing or something and saying, you know what? Screw it. I'm never going to make any money. I'm just going to roll the dice here. And then on CNBC, you got people coming on like Leon Cooperman crying because why are the Redditors were the problem. I mean, we're always blaming the victims or, you know, they wanted to try and get back at a hedge fund. Well, that you should get. I, I mean, I, this is all in my Twitter feed, but I mean, it's like with examples. With, with I say I have the receipts, man. I have the receipts. I have the videos. I have the links. Well, the Neil Kashkari thing is, you know, pretty ridiculous. Like people, a lot of people don't know. They're not even is. old enough to remember that he... He was chosen by Hank Paulson, who was mm -hmm. previously the head of Goldman Sachs, who then became Treasury Secretary. He was chosen by his former boss at Goldman, Hank Paulson, to lead mm -hmm. TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which was the $700 billion bailout. And then he subsequently became the head of the Minnesota Federal Reserve. And yeah. what's also interesting about Neil Kashkari is that if you look at the messaging that he used to realign his brand, it was very much built on social justice and disadvantaged oh, people and disadvantaged yeah. groups and income inequality. As he's calling for more inflation. Right. So I think, I look, I agree. And I think that the fish rots at the head, right? So like people take notice of what our leadership is doing, 100%. But I do think that, I guess the reason why I'm also asking isn't just because 
I think it's important to just understand what is and what isn't. I also think that we are at a place today where the citizenry of the United States has become very comfortable spending their entire time pointing at the leadership and pointing out all the things that they've done wrong. And they haven't had this like aha moment, which is to say, oh, wait a minute, this is a democratic republic. Like we're actually fundamentally at base level in charge of this country. It's not the people in Washington. We have sovereignty. And so what can we and what should we do about it? And I think we saw rumblings of that in 2016 with the election of Donald Trump. But I still think that there's this weird disconnect. And I think it's part of this like childish culture that's almost like a fixture of empire. You know, America's become this giant empire. The US bond market is the biggest thing in the world. We're able to fund these wars as you talk about and these social welfare programs without actually having to raise taxes in order to do it. And people have become complacent. And so the question for me is, how do we change that? Because the change isn't going to happen from the people who are not responsive. They're not going to suddenly get it. Something has to change in order for that dynamic to change. And I think what's at stake today, if it doesn't change, is our freedom. You know, I don't think we're at a place where we're just going to kind of bottom bounce here. This is as low as it gets. The technologies that are coming online and the revolution that's happening in artificial intelligence is going to create the potential for a new kind of surveillance state that was just unimaginable in the past. So we have, in my view, a responsibility to change that. And that's what I want the second hour of our conversation to be about, Rudy. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Rudy, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Rudy, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed. Okay. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.